City Council Budget Workshop. We'll say the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll start as we started yesterday. If anyone has uh, any uh, any second thoughts, or and then we'll have Cindy give us a recapitulation of where we are or are not. Does anyone like to make comment? Okay, Cindy, you're you? before, Cindy. before Cindy starts, the biggest job today is to come out with a maximum millage rate that we can set that will be placed because that is a legal obligation that we have coming from this meeting today. Yeah. Go ahead. Absolutely. Anything you want. Thank you. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to review this electric system optimization generation plan. I would suggest it certainly uh, would give every, every council some information. I think, you know, closing down the, the power plant, we all thought, oh, this is going to be some great savings. I think there are some really shocking numbers in here, and um, I guess we will be discussing that further with electric. That is very true. One of the issues in that report is if you sold it for the highest and best use based on their assessed value and we still had to clean it up with the environmental taking the building down, we're about $5 million in the hole. So just to put it in perspective. I think they the idea of lowering rates by doing this is, is really... <laughs> well, the, the operation, I think, will have a positive impact where we can lower rates. I, I think the issue here, because the long-term risk of the power plant, but the key is, is what do we do with the plant after it is, uh, we've abandoned it? How do we keep it sort of uh, cocooned for a period of time? And I, I think what you heard yesterday, and of course we have to get to that point, but what you heard from Ted yesterday, we still have to decide, are we going to leave the uh, uh, substation there? And we do have some switches that we're going to have to do some repairs to, which will be normal operation. I think. What this report really tells us is the day that we try to change the use of the land, take the building down. Uh, they give the example in there of the Fort Pierce experience, which is not a very good experience. No, no. So, uh, hopefully, we've operated better than Fort Pierce, but still, yeah, uh, that's true. And whenever you dig ground around here, you don't know what you're going to find. Yeah, it seemed to say the highest and best use of the power plant is the power plant, but and we don't, we don't want it. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> to summarize it. That's anyway, uh, Cindy, would you like to tell us where we are or not? Um, as we talked about from our first day on the general fund and nothing really changed in the second day, um, we gained about 97000 in revenue and then we dedicated did that amount to a $60,000 reduction in the transfer from the electric utility and about $35,000 net for the um, new position halfway through the year in the city attorneys. So we were pretty much where we started at the end of that. You know, yesterday when we talked about Fund 304, which is in part being supported by a transfer from the general fund, um, we did reduce reduce the chief's budget in 1516, which is the year we're working on, by, you know, maybe $100,000. He's got 140 in there, and, and you did direct him to at least remove the lead and take care of that problem, which I heard him say might be, you know, $50,000. But at the same time, I heard a number of comments about moving some of those recreation projects, like tattered awnings, into the current year. So I would say, given what I heard yesterday, we're pretty much where we started on Fund 304 as well. Those are the only two two that affect your millage setting. Um, we made some changes in the electric utility, but again, that electric utility budget was predicated on um, on uh, the current rates until we know something more based on our negotiations with OUC and our attempt to shut down the plant. Um, the puts and takes in the electric utility that I kept track of, uh, the addition of $500,000 to, um, to the professional services for legal costs, but you know, taking away about two ninety for um, for the software that was double counted, and then adding back a couple of other things were about net zero anyway. So really, we're, we're essentially with puts and takes where we started the week on Monday. So if, if we were going to include a, a number for um, funding the, the OPED, um, and that's sort of 350, 
then we've got to take out 350 somewhere. I mean, that's the way it stands right now. Yes, and you know? and, and we, we haven't made those decisions. And, but and, that's, I, and I owe you a conversation about the OPEB and about the partial funding of OPEB. So if whenever you're ready, I know Eric's here and you want to get through these yeah. enterprise funds, but maybe we can talk a little more about <coughs> the OPEB and numbers after we get through the, the various departments. And, yeah. okay, but yes, the, the bottom line is you would have to take something else out. At so the if, if, um, if, if we kind of said to, that Dodger Town now – May spring loose 250 uh, at some particular time. Is there a restriction about how that could be used? Could we pull out um, something and say contingent on that? Uh, we could do that. Uh, and is it only um, uh, capital expenditures, or is it? Or can it be operating? Or well, it is. But remember, you've subsidized capital expenditures with money from the general fund. So if you should free up the Dodgertown money, you can use that on capital expenditures and lower your transfer from the general okay, fund okay. and replace that with OPEB. There's a way to so, do it, though. Rightly. So certainly if you are if you are inclined to fund OPEB if you can, but you don't want to give up anything that's already in the budget, you could simply say, let's press forward with our Dodgertown initiative. If we sell it and do away with the debt service, then we can amend the budget to include some OPEB funding. If we fund it any time before the end of the coming fiscal year, we could have the actuary recalculate the ARC based on funding a trust, and we could put the money into a trust, as long as we do it before September 30th of next year. Mr. Airport Director. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Eric Menger, the Airport Director. Hey, and I'll, I guess we'll get into the first enterprise fund, which should be easy peasy. <laughs> the dollar amounts are way less, uh, should not impact, at least not directly, the uh, millage rate. Um, the airport is self-sufficient, as you all know, and has been for many years, meaning that we do not require an a influx of ad valorem taxes to, uh, to operate. Could you please let the public know how rare it is to have an airport that is self-sufficient? <laughs> sure. Um, it's about 25 percent of general aviation airports nationwide, and we're in that 25 percent that are self-sufficient. Uh, a lot of the airports in Florida do require some sort of um, money from, you know, the larger government body, whether it be a city or county or whatever, to uh, to operate. And so we're fortunate in that we don't, and that is really none of my doing. That's because the fathers years ago that brought in uh, Piper and Flight Safety and, you know, all the businesses. Water and Sewer Department also contributes, of course, to the to the rental, paying rent to, to use the airport. So uh, it's, it does keep us self-sufficient, and, and we're going to try to keep it that way. And that's really what we are always look at when we're doing our strategic planning. Um, and it's a dynamic environment, as you know. Uh, one of the things working uh, as a city-owned airport is that we have, you know, where you act as a department of the city. But at the same time, we're in competition, really, with businesses around the airport as well as other airports. And... Uh, we're working all the time to try to run it as much like a business as we can, given the restrictions that we have, uh, not only from local government, but state and federal, which are huge with all the regulatory requirements that we have. But so far, so good. I passed out a little fact sheet that gives statistics, and I'm not going to really go over that. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is we are a busy airport. And as uh, Council Member Turner pointed out, we're also self-sufficient. But... We're right now the sixth busiest airport in the state of Florida, and that's compared to all airports. That's based on number of operations that we have. Over 200,000 operations, obviously a lot of those are training aircraft that are repetitive, but we, we do keep pretty busy out there. Uh, and another example might be Melbourne Airport, which has fewer uh, airport operations than ours. Uh, Naples Airport is maybe more similar in that they're municipally owned you know, upscale type of uh, community, and they have about 95,000 operations and a staff of about 65 people. Um, we have eight. Uh, Fort Lauderdale Executive has 19 staff members. That's another municipal-owned airport with a very active they, – they're not even Part 139 certified like we are, but they have 19 staff members. We have eight. We've been really working hard with our first stringers to try to keep this airport in good shape, and that's why in this budget you'll see us asking for two additional people. Probably one of our biggest expenditures 
uh, bringing in additional two people to assist with the administrative side and the operational side, just like one in each uh, side of the airport. We call that the air side and the land side, so sometimes you might hear me say that, air side being inside the security fence at the airport, the airport operations area, that's the area where we have to maintain a lot of federal requirements in order to maintain our Part 139 certification. Uh, Part 139 being the FAA regulation that certifies airports, and we, we meet that annually with inspections. Um, so on the air side and land side, we're really strapped. And also we're looking at some secession planning because we really haven't had much of that lately. Um, we have, as everyone knows, an aging you know, a city employee population base. And our youngest is sitting right behind me at 35 and, and proud of it. <laughs> uh, but we, we get it. You could get that information. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because uh, girls don't like to say that, you know. <laughs> hey, just. So, but we, we not need. really relative to the <laughs> If I ramble, you just you know, refocus. refocus. <laughs> okay. But I just think that we need to be looking at those things because the first stringers are starting to wear out and we're going to have some, some needs over the next five years that we're going to need to do some, some refreshing, and that's what we're trying to do. And the master plan, as you know, you've all been a part of that, and you're going to see that in front of you here in September, for the hopefully September, by the, for the final review. Um, that's our 20-year plan. Um, I'm showing that in the other graphic I, I passed around, which is this graphic right here, shows all the colors. That, that's a graphic representation of what we plan in the next five years, but we also have a 20-year plan that goes along with that. And it all ties in with where is this airport going to go in the next 20 years, and how are we going to plan for that? And one step in that whole process is, for this coming year, is bringing in two additional people. But Jim and I have been talking, and, and finding it that we're not exactly sure how those two people are going to be hired right now. Really, I'm looking for some flexibility uh, from, from Jim and the council to allow that dollar amount to be put in the budget. Uh, we're looking for an administrative person and an operations person, but through the airport mass planning process and by unanimous vote of the airport commission, we are also pursuing airline service. Uh, if an airline is to sign up, say, sometime in this next fiscal year, and we bring on that uh, at the commuter aircraft and we start looking at some uh, transportation security administration requirements tsa along with the faa requirements uh, we may need to instead of uh, bringing on an administrative person for example we might need to bring a security person just to focus on security uh, and tsa requirements so we're going to request at this point what we need if not changes we will need this these two folks but if something does change after the beginning of the fiscal year into you know December and January and things are looking good and the economy continues, there's a lot of ifs. The economy continues to do well. The fuel prices stay kind of low. Uh, you know, other uh, uh, airports are not more competitive than Vero Beach for attracting airline service, which is possible. Uh, if we're able to be successful in that road, and we think we do have a good story to tell, and it can answer questions on that if you like. But it, it seems like if we're successful, we may need to adjust how we even hire folks, and Jim and I will discuss that. But what we're looking for, you know, from, from you all is just let's set the budget now, give us some flexibility in management. So session planning, airline type of things, those are dynamic, and we just need to be ready to, to do that. Would the TSA um, security person be in addition to the other two? Or would it be instead of? Instead of, probably. And that, what we did there is we also increased our part-time account, uh, about $20,000, which for us was a pretty good increase, uh, so that we have some flexibility in part-time. So what we might need to do is, for example, put in a security person but have a part-time administrative person to help rather than a full-time administrative person. So we need to, what, what we've done is a $20,000 increase in the, uh, the part-time account and then added the two full-time FTEs uh, for what we need right now, um, asking for some flexibility and, you know, allowing Jim and I to make the decision when needed at that point as the things change. Yeah, because bottom line, um, if you approve the total expenditure amount, if whatever the planning arrives at would exceed that amount, he would have to come for a budget Absolutely. amendment. But as long as it's that amount or lower, you've really, you know, approved the bottom line and approved the two people and given him the flexibility. Yeah, they, they probably won't come in for the full year anyway, right? That's probably true. I, I, we're, for example, just in the operation side. Right now we're making do with four people, but we're almost, you know, probably at least half, almost three quarters through the mowing season. When the grass starts to slow down, 
the mowing tends to slow down, and we end up using the people a little bit more for catch-up, <clears throat> you know, trying to do building maintenance things and proactive type things to try to prevent future building maintenance issues on the airport. Remember, we have 1,700 acres and millions of square feet of uh, building space, uh, T-hanger facilities that, that are wearing over time and that need to be maintained. So we kind of swap back and forth, but we're always playing catch-up. With, with one additional uh, person there in the ops side, we would be able to focus on building maintenance or the land side type of facilities year-round and not be so, you know, seasonal. Well, why, why is it that other airports have 20 people you have four? What's the difference? Uh, well, Naples, for example, they, they sell their own fuel. So the Naples airport has, well, there's a couple reasons. One is the, the fuel sales. They have their own FBO, fixed base operator. And we don't. All, all of our business, we, what we do is lease property to businesses who then in turn meet the market with fuel sales. So they have their staff and we don't. Whereas Naples, they're the only fuel supplier and they do their own fuel sales. It's a huge revenue producer for the airport, but we've always taken the position that we'd rather have the private sector do that. Now, the other thing is they have an airport authority. An airport authority is a standalone, uh, you know, just has no, no other responsibility other than taking care of the airport. And so they, the airport manager there reports directly to a board, and that's it. And so they're able to be more flexible, and they can do things like a little bit more business-oriented where they're able to possibly uh, you know, raise the salary to be more competitive with the market. Uh, the airport manager there makes about $180,000 a year, and it's, uh, like I said, 95,000 operations per year. Uh, it's a much, and they don't have airline service either, although they're working on it, same as we are. So th things are just dependent a lot of who owns the airport. In a municipal airport, you have to work under the umbrella of the uh, municipality, and so we work as in the whole thing. Randy, we used to have more people at the airport, historically speaking. So when we started doing reductions of headcounts, it affected him Correct. as a department of the city. So we, we did that universally uh, across the organization. But there were more people. And it was also a reflection of the downturn in the economy, oh, that the airport was not being utilized. Yeah. 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 So, but that's 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 the that's the truth. That's the honest answer to the difference. And you'll find the bigger airports usually end up with, uh, you know, just they're they're focused more on just the airport system. So, but we're and we're actually at a little bit of a crossroads, and you all need to be aware of that because in the master planning process, when it comes to you, you'll, you'll see we're we're looking at moving toward the airline. Uh, facility at the airport and become a commercial service airport, which will make some differences. It'll also be some character changes at the airport. You know, we, we've always been a general aviation airport, very friendly to the uh, private and commercial, uh, private commercial market. In other words, not scheduled airline service, but corporate jet traffic and recreational flying. We'll have, because of security requirements, if we make that shift, there'll be somewhat of a change to how the airport operates, mainly with security requirements from TSA, but also from a federal funding uh, perspective and a lot of things like um, uh, PFCs, which is a passenger facility charge, a PFC. That is a revenue source that commercial airports are able to uh, tie into from ticketing at the airline service. It brings in quite a bit of revenue for airports. And, those things uh, are needed because terminal buildings need to be modified. And those things may happen. That's all in here. Obviously, it's planning only. We're, we're doing our planning looking at – it's really tough to, to make a decision, you know, five or ten years out when you don't really know where the economy is going to go or fuel prices or what airline is going to do. But if these things happen, we have to at least have it in our plan because, number one, the Federal Aviation Administration requires it. We cannot get any federal funding without a um, airport master plan. And also because it's just good business sense. We want to try to do our best to try to anticipate what might happen. Is this up on the website? Is your plan up on the website? Not yet because it hasn't been approved by this body. And I think this ought to be up, up there too somewhere. You know, it's good. You can do that. Yeah. I don't believe that one is up on the website. Or our website manager is right behind me. So she's probably taking notes. <laughs> so a big, the biggest things, though, if you look at our budget, is uh, on page one set of 171 is what I'm looking at, which I hope is the same thing you all have. I, 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 <laughs> that's where you have the overall uh, budget summary, which I think does a great job putting it all on one page where you can kind of see where you are dollar-wise. And the biggest change in the revenue is we're up about 5.2 percent. We're projecting a 5.2 increase, and some of that is additional leasing that's going on. Uh, you saw the Ocalina Bank and Walking Tree. Uh, some others are happening, too. 
Let me just hope that keeps moving that way. Can you pull the mic closer? Oh, I'm sorry. Do I have to start all over from the <laughs> 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 start all over from you know step one? Sorry about that. Um, so, and then, but what you all see right after that is the total operating expenses are up 9%, and a lot of that is the personnel request. So we have a total uh, surplus difference. We're down by 7.8% from 537 last year to a projected 495 this year. Still only about a 40,000 difference, even with all the changes that we're, we're asking, uh, you know, for additional funds to uh, pursue an airline service and for additional funds for staffing. We're still only about a 40,000 difference uh, in the in the overall surplus that we see and we will be in the black anyway even with those additional expenses we've uh, thanks to uh, cindy and her capital improvement um, project budget we know how much we're going to spend each year how much we're supposed to do and that has already been brought into account in this so yeah i think this new uh, format for the capital expenditures has been great and i'm glad to hear as a manager that you're yeah, finding that a useful it's, tool it's yeah. the best i've seen since this I've been whole here. year this this 20-year idea of what you're going to be doing is terrific i wish every department could do this well i like to put in a picture just because it's, <laughs> it brings it all together yeah. and plus if you have you know you see how it ties together and where it falls out so and we have to do it, Randy. And we actually have, we, <laughs> this, is an, this is an FAA requirement to, to put this together. We haven't done one in 15 years, um, and that's because of the recession primarily. Everything plat plateaued. And so the FAA, yes, they require it, but they also have a little common sense in that they didn't force us to do a plan when we really nothing was changing. So now that it has come up and started to pick back up, the funding was available, and we, we initiated the plan. Mentioned the regional. Took a term of the One of the things that came up at the airport commission meeting as we talked about future planning and that fork in the road where we go to airline service is how do we be best market the airport to show outsiders, if you will, airline companies and those that are not familiar with Vero Beach, other than Dodgers perhaps, you know, and Disney Vero Beach and things like that. You know, what is it that brings the airport out? We'd like to begin naming, call the airport the Vero Beach Regional Airport, in that that's what it actually is. The, the Vero Beach Airport serves a region, obviously does not serve only, you know, the municipality itself, but really a region. In fact, the impact of the airport is about $468 million on the economic, uh, on the economic impact of the community. That's based on an FDOT study from 2014. So with Piper and Cannon's Restaurant and Flight Safe, you've heard my ad. You know, the, the, <laughs> these are the these are the things that really generate ad valorem taxes and utility uh, income and uh, just the job market itself. There's about 3,500 people that work in and around the airport, attracted there initially, of course, by our anchor tenants, Piper and others. But that brings in a huge economic impact to the community. And obviously, everybody at Piper does not live in the city of Vero Beach. They come from St. Lucie County and Brevard. Mm -hmm. So it's a regional uh, airport. It's a facility that uh, we'd like to more properly name. And we think that that will let the air airlines and others uh, and other businesses that, OK, that sounds that it perks, you know, piques their attention a little bit. Then we'll follow up with uh, a marketing plan that is part of, part of the master plan to start. Uh, but also will be part of the airline uh, pursuit that we'll be showing you when we get to that point. We're in the process of creating that at this point. What does it take to change the name? It takes your approval, number one. You probably get that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's on the July 21st City Council meeting. Okay. And uh, uh, if that is approved, then I have to go through an FAA process. It's not really that lengthy. It's just we have to change some things because, you know, when they do uh, approach plates for pilots and charts and things for pilots, they have to put on their pro proper name. That's all. So in the next printing, they're going to do the printing anyway. There's no additional cost. But in the next printing, they have to coordinate so that these things are changed. And then there's also, uh, you know, uh, just the FAA has to have their say in it. Well, you know, it, uh, Vero Beach is a strong brand. That's a good thing. And regional is a much stronger word than municipal. It's just good marketing. I don't know why we wouldn't do it. That's primarily the reason. It's marketing It's that effort. simple. Yes, sir. It's just marketing. It won't want. change the ownership. It won't change anything the way we operate. It'll just, you know, we'll, we'll change our name. And, you know, instead of on our fact sheet where it says Vero Beach Municipal Airport, we'll put Vero Beach Regional Airport. Uh, Does that help in getting uh, more you know, service, commuter service? I, th I think it will. It's certainly not the only thing, but uh, we could change it to international. 
Magnificent. Magnificent. <laughs> when we thought about the Vero Beach Galactic Airport, you know, why not go for the? We've just been to Pluto. Let's just. You know. But we we're going to we're going to baby steps, you know. But we think that's probably a good, and that does fit where we already are. Even if we don't achieve airline service, Vero Beach Regional would fit. I'll preview to Tuesday. I think you've got it. So. Thank you. And then once I once I have the formal approval, then uh, we'll, we'll and also I'm asking the the mayor for so, yes, some support there and those things, and you'll see all that on the city council agenda. Um, we're just we're just moving forward as the airport commission has unanimously decided to support this and recommend this to council, and we're just trying to make it happen. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one thing I did want to, do you mind if I point this out? <clears throat> no, I know this is something that we have in the plan. If you look, just really, oh, yeah, yeah, really interesting. if you look at the uh, graphic, a big blue square in the middle there, number three, is a solar farm. Believe it or not, uh, solar farms are getting to the point where they may be cost effective and also be, I hope, an assistance to the overall city in diversifying your energy resources, plus benefit the airport in leasing the property that more than likely can't be leased any other way. It's right between the two runways, and it has some height restrictions because of the tower line of sight issues. But we have about 40 acres there that we think um, we're looking at already and working with the gym and the utilities department and trying to uh, just find out if it would be feasible if it would be a true benefit to the city as well as to the airport and to the private company, it'd be a public-private partnership that would actually install the, the facility because it would be um, to their benefit to do it privately because they get federal credits for solar farms, whereas the municipality would not. So we would like to pursue that avenue. It's, it's, not, it's in here, although it has not been approved by everyone yet because it's in the master plan and we're in this transition phase, but I wanted you to point that out because it's, it's, it has, it's not our first, not the first time it's been done. It's not really our idea. The one, the, the little thing I've shown here, I'll just pass it around, is, is Lakeland. Lakeland uh, Regional Airport has uh, recently done this and they are creating about $250,000 of revenue to the airport and the, uh, also assisting with the diversification of their municipal utility and their meeting environmental goals that they'd like to meet to try to reduce their, their footprint. And it has actually helped. They, they estimate that their solar farm is the equivalent of removing 31,000 cars off the road by the amount of energy it's creating from the sun versus fossil fuels. Who is the operator of their facility? Uh, it says on there, it's not, uh, I have to review that myself, it's not, it's not, Con Edison is the one that we've been talking to, but there's others out there also that, that do this kind Con of Edison. thing. There it is, okay. Just, just uh, for information, we've also included Chef and Bill in our discussions about this, so as they're looking forward as to the diversification as well as pricing, that we would have that, so we've engaged virtually everybody in the process. It, it, it's got to be what sold to the city or something, or, or it can't be. It can't be a third-party supplier. Right? Well, we're really not sure how it would be, but if the prices are right, we want them to sell it to the city, and then therefore we have less demand from our other suppliers. This is obviously a, a um, cheaper cost because of the energy issues, but one of the the installation and capital cost investment is the one that we would have to negotiate a deal that makes it long-term enough for them to recover their costs. Because when we talk about public-private partnerships, I get a little nervous because usually the public gets the shaft on those deals. <laughs> and so I would prefer to keep it where the term of the contract's long enough and the risk sharing is, is limited. Craig's on done part. a lot of these uh, 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 partnership, you know, private partnership, private public partnerships. You Great. Know, you don't Right. And the key that we have to find is how it would work in, because this is not baseload energy. Uh, it, it's like when the clouds come and the night comes, uh, this is not going to necessarily have a battery pack up, a backup because there's a major expense involved in that. So you have to price that and put that in as a non-reliable, actually non-reliable power supply. So how does that fit into our mix? All those type of contingencies would have to be addressed and the contract 
as you know, in the electric utility, nothing's easy. But it, it is a it is a very good, very potential power source. Yeah. Yeah. All right, are there comments on page 171 to 183, and then we can probably should go to the capital budget and take a look at that so we understand it. I don't have any comments, I'm just, you can page through. No, my questions were addressed by Eric's, yeah. <laughs> Eric, Eric, thank you. Well, if that's so, it would take us to 180 in the capital budget probably the best way to do this Eric is just go through each sheet and talk about it so we understand it. Uh, the summary is okay it'll be a little harder for me to understand it anyway are we on 183 183, 183 yeah 180. I, I would like to make a comment about Eric's revenue sources that he I, I think um, my assistant finance director, Javier, and, and has been talking to you about this. Oh. Um, the federal government has decided in their infinite wisdom to up the ante on the requirements for grant compliance for uh, federal single audits. So we face the challenge because so much of the revenue that supports these capital expenditures, um, we're going to face some additional challenges for his administrative staff in the coming year in complying with the federal regulations so that we can have clean uh, federal single audits. You know, if you look at our CAFRs year over year, the, the airport being the greatest source of grant net revenue is almost always the, the programs that are actually audited by our auditors for that federal compliance. So certainly his adding another administrative person, that adds a little fuel to that fire as well because there's going to be some extra stuff that has to be done. Danielle knows about Cindy, it. Cindy, since you raised the question of audit, where are, where are we in our responses back from the FAA regarding their audit? I know this is... <laughs> yeah, it's been going on for years since, yeah, since, that's since, right. since 2011. And, you know, the city had responded back in November of 2011 and waited until January of this year to get a response from the federal government. It was in Washington sitting there, and there were changes of staff and whatnot. They finally sent a, a letter back to the region, which is Atlanta, or FAA region, which then went through our local airports district office in Orlando and sent us a letter which indicated, hey, we haven't heard from you in a while, but we haven't heard from them either, and they, they would like to hear a response. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Jim put together a, uh, a group of us to work to uh, make a, a response back to the FAA. We recently had a teleconference, and the FAA seems to be uh, agreeable to work with us. It's just a matter of getting through the, the details. And we've got it really close. The city attorney's office has been terrific. Finance director's been terrific. We've got it. We've got water and sewer online, police department online. Everybody, I think, is on the same page. And now we just need to have a response to them. I think it's by September 14th uh, in writing. So that's our next goal. And I, th I guess we expect to bring something to you all to review. Is that a response to the 2011, or what is the response? They're, 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 yeah. Probably prior to that. <laughs> Probably prior to that. It's, it's been in a box in the same warehouse with our FEMA appeal. Oh. <laughs> Next to the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, I was going to say the same type of. <laughs> what, it, what it is is the FAA started questioning some of the charges, and there was an anonymous letter written to the FAA. And so that anonymous letter got somebody's attention in D.C., but the question was, for example, we charge the airport $90,000 a year for police protection. And it has a long legacy to it, but now we, you all will be approving an MOU with that. We also treat uh, contaminated water and put it into our water system uh, through our water treatment plant. And the FAA questions, why, are they, why is the airport paying for that treatment of the water and not getting any of the revenues out of the water system? So we're going through an issue, are there royalties? Uh, we have uncovered that, for example, the rent that we pay was sort of an arbitrary number by a resolution that a previous city council did. And the only thing we can trace back is that at one time the airport was not maybe meeting all of its numbers. And so the city council at that time, instead of doing a direct transfer, said, well, we'll just do an arbitrary rent. And so, so we're looking at those rents, and uh, in order to try to a answer FAA, maybe say a portion of our rent goes to those so-called royalties. But at the same time, we have an argument of who owns the water. The, the fact of the matter is the state of Florida says we own the water, and FAA says, well, wait a minute, the airport owns the water. That logic and that has been circular in nature 
for quite some time. And then now at our recent phone call, do an appraisal of what the water value is. Well, water coming out of a deep well has no value until it's treated. And we're paying to treat the water because we pay rent. So the question is, is what is the value of the water coming out? Uh, the lady in, was it one in DC that said the there's- Brooks, I think that's the, that's the, that's the, um, Houston. the region, From southern region. The southern region. Anyway, she says there are appraisers that can tell you the value of water coming out of the ground. But anyway, we, we, we're using our logic to respond and my position has been we will respond with what we think is the best answer. If they have another answer, then they will respond back to us. But we've got to show a relationship of taking from the airport and what we're paying in return for that asset. The other things, the MOU with the police department, we feel like that we can do that because we can list the services that we provide, similar to what we do with the uh, fire department with the county. We have a, a contract with them. The price is a little higher with the fire department, but they actually, yeah. yeah, but they actually house somebody on the, on the site. Although we pay for the fire truck, as an example, and uh, and there are other little issues that we have to have an MOU. Uh, I think the MOU all has has to also be with water and sewer. So we're putting that together, but those will have to be documents and resolutions passed by the city council that we will pass on to FAA. We have taken a position in our response to FAA, we would like to have council endorsement of those actions. And so therefore, if FAA has an issue, it, it's an issue with the total city. It, so it, it really is a It'd cleaning be an up. issue just with you and Aaron. Yeah, I was, <laughs> was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I realize that. Yeah, bad news is good to be focused on one. <laughs> but but uh, we we think we have a grouping in FAA. When we talk to them, uh, you had the Orlando folks in this telecommunication as well as the other folks, whoever they might be. Mm -hmm. And, and the names keep changing to protect the innocent in the FAA, so we, we still work with whoever is on the end of the phone. And, uh, and Eric does a very good job because when they change people, they change personalities, they also change their perception of their role in communication with the local airport. Yeah, they have their own interpretation. And some people are saying, I can't say yes or no. Others are saying, yes, I can say yes or no. And so we go through that that exercise but it's as Cindy said it's similar to dealing with uh, FEMA uh, we will continue to shift paper back and forth we think we're getting closer uh, the lady that we talked to that's really in charge of this I get the firm impression she has a box to check off <laughs> and I've got to get this resolved and please help me resolve it so that's what we're trying to do but we have a US we haven't got a pile of money like with the we other do one. That. Right? We do with regard to the water royalty. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I mean a possible liability. We had to pay it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Which is different from FEMA. I'm sorry. Which is different from FEMA in that we've already paid all the money we don't think we owe them. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, is the value, and, and that's the type of debate, uh, who owns the water, A, but our permits are through the state, so the state has pretty well said we own the water. Mm -hmm. uh, how far that will go and how far they want to fight, I don't know. And then, then if FAA owns the water or the airport owns the water or whoever might own the water, what is the value of raw water that can't be drank and, and in some cases have a contamination yeah. that is a leg legacy contamination from possibly the Navy or someone else that's been there? So the answer to the question is it's very confusing <laughs> and it's ongoing. And you're sorry we had, I'm sorry I asked. I, like I just wanted to make sure we were up and yeah. Do you want to get up to speed on the contamination issue? That'll no, take another half don't. hour. No. Okay. Oh, okay. It's complex. So that brings us to 183. Are you happy with that, Cindy? Eric, why don't you run through these and if you know, talk about each one and then uh, if there's any questions, I'm sure they'll be asked. On 183? Yeah, this is the construction marker light west. Okay. Yeah, what, uh, what, <clears throat> careful, yeah. Uh, well, Jim gave me his, but I'm not sure where. Uh, 183 is the summary that I'm showing. Oh, no. It's in our. Oh, okay. All right. I'll give that one back. Happens to be the Sorry same about page. that. It's been. It's, e I'm it's easier to work with this book than the other okay. one. I'm just not sure what, what you all have. In it happened to be the same page number. That is weird. It is, okay. 
All right, well, all right, so Construct Mark Light West GA Apron Phase 3 is an ongoing project, which we've already, uh, you all have already approved, and we're just in process. So we're showing it as, because we're spending it under over multiple fiscal years. And this was just one that's already going, and we're doing some apron work out at the uh, west side of the airport. And this is the public-private partnership, too, by the way, where the, uh, the match funding for this grant is not coming from the city or the airport, it's coming from the FBOs. They're, they're interested enough to have this work done. Uh, that they're willing to fund our match grant portion of this uh, multi-million dollar project uh, because they do see the economy starting to come back and they'd like to, to them it's a lot cheaper than obviously than building their own ramp out there we're using state funding we're managing the project they're covering the match so it's zero cost to the airport it went for everybody um, the airport master plan is also ongoing and we talked about that the uh, core commercial park is an, another ongoing project this one has we've even had to extend this is one that I think was delayed primarily because of recession issues and just nothing really going on but the goal was to try to renovate some of the existing leasable properties that we have at the airport and we're working right now on um, what we call building 78 which is a uh, old Navy building right at the corner of Aviation Boulevard and Piper Drive um, you see faux effects used to be there and you can also see med repairs as a business is located there we're, we we need to bring that up to speed and uh, we've already done the roof now we're in the parking now we're working on doing all the electrical work and bringing it up to code and when that's done we'll have I think it's about 7500 leasable uh, space 7500 square feet of leasable space there um, so and that's just one of the we've also part of the grant uh, monies here were spent to demolish the existing facility at the Ocalina site. Um, we've already used some grant money for that. That was way more expensive yeah. than we thought because we found a lot of as you know Jim says when you dig somewhere you're going to find something yeah. at the airport and we found a lot of concrete that the Navy just dug a hole and and we never knew it was it. There was a restaurant built, built yeah. right over yeah. it. So for all these years, we just thought it was dirt underneath. Turned out to be about $130,000 worth of concrete had to be, I mean, uh, the cost to remove it was 130000 And a lot of, some of that, by the way, went to reef restoration down in St. Lucie County. That's where they trucked it. Yep. So it was, it was used. Um, and then Taxiway Charlie is a project coming up. Right now that's in the design phase. That would be... The, our main taxiway that that is uh, parallel to the main runway and critical. so on, on this map it's the uh, green one is that or, no no I'm sorry the, uh, the number blue, one the blue it's number uh, one uh, yes sir okay. item project number one it's a great map by the way we've uh, been doing this since for many years actually it was requested by a city manager in years past, and we just kept doing it because it, it is useful. Um, Denmark Light Taxiway Echo uh, coming up in the future. That is the blue item number two there, uh, which would help to open up the center portion of the airfield and improve the safety uh, of the airfield by keeping aircraft that are coming from the north ramp area, which is that lavender or purplish area with number seven on it aircraft that come from there won't have to cross the runway in order to get to the far west side of the runway which is a safety aspect and why we're trying to do that it's a it's a dual purpose to improve safety and to increase the uh, access so how to much of number two is there right now just the gray portion okay it's, thank you everything that's not colored is existing okay i understand thank you um let's see the north apron is follow-up to that, also redoing the uh, pavement in that area. And what's that on the That number seven. The reason it's a little bit out of order there is because in this graphic we have shown some of the master plan projects that have not yet been approved, just so you can see they're coming. Um, terminal building upgrade for commercial service, item number four. That won't even happen unless we need to do it, but we had to plan for it. And it's in the master plan, which you will see when it comes before you in the future in the next couple of months. But um, all some of those projects, we wanted to show everything that we're really thinking about doing. Uh, we're also showing the funding sources. Uh, the solar energy development, for example, is shown as private because it's going to be handled by a private company. We, we <coughs> hopefully would receive just benefit from that. Um, okay, then, what page are we on now? I just went. I just skipped over to the graphic for a second. So let's see. Uh, 
you know, 189 is is really uh, just it's the light, it's a vehicle lease purchase that's been proposed, and I, I understand accepted by the Public Works Department. So that we will be a portion, of, we will be a part of that, just like every other department. Yes. Next. And 191 is what uh, number on the map? Let's see. Page 191. Reconstruct Center Apen is um, is it number nine? That's right, number nine. So that's the apron right in front of the terminal building? Yes, yes. And that's way out, 1718. That is out a little bit, and um, you might need to, that also includes a lot, the concrete as well as asphalt. And we'll have an opportunity with that project to modify it based on whether or not airline service comes in. And we have it in there. I mean, if we, if we don't have an airline service, it's just an overlay and see what it is. If, if we do have airline service, it might include some additional uh, requirements that would need to be met by an aircraft that might have turning radiuses and things that we don't meet right now, no, a larger aircraft. Uh, different airlines use different size aircraft. Your, your runway is only big enough to take what? Uh, uh, a, uh, Up to about a 737. Uh, we have actually 737s come in pretty regularly. It's, we have one that comes in fairly regularly. It's a, called a Boeing business jet because it's configured for not passengers, but for business. So you can't take a 757, but you can take a, all the 737s, 737, 737, 800, 900? Well, some of the larger ones could be a weight problem uh, or, or on a regular basis. You know, once in a while, uh, it's not that big of a deal, but uh, and especially you know, it depends on the loading of the aircraft with, with fuel, as you know. And, uh, we even have had a 757 come in. We had Air Force Two come in as a 757. So uh, we can handle it. It's just that if you, you know, FAA starts to get interested and the engineers start to get interested, if you have regular heavy use of the, the end of the runway, it will start to do damage to the pavement. So then you have to, you have to improve the, the width or the, the weight loading for the, for the pavement. But we wouldn't as, aspire to more than a mid-level 737 anyway. So. I don't think so. I mean, right now we're really looking for more like a regional jet, maybe a 50 to 100 seat. A jet that we already see. You know, we see Gulfstream fours, fives. We see the 737 periodically. So we already can handle fairly good size uh, jet traffic. And the regional traffic that we're looking at with an airline would be pretty, pretty small. I mean, it wouldn't be anything huge, and maybe two to three flights a day. So that's what we have right now. Probably can handle it. The only thing we might need is there is one airline that is is looking at a requesting and if they were to come here would be requesting a widening of the runway they have a company policy the aircraft could actually land the way we have it but their company policy for safety cushion is 155 150 foot width and we have 106 so we might if that were to be something that everybody agreed this is what way we want to go expensive would have to pursue uh, widening and that would be expensive and but commercial airport brings in additional funding from the FAA and those things are okay all of a sudden you're a regional airport you have an airline and like I said there's where the shift of is it always been 106 since the time of the Navy or how did it get it was it was 200 in the Navy days and it still is underneath but we've only been able to pave 106 because of our critical aircraft and when I'm talking about critical aircraft that is the most used aircraft that the FAA says okay we see that you really need such and such width well the only width that we've been able to fund is up to that particular width uh, if we had regular 757s or something then critical aircraft would require us to would have required us long ago to widen it or keep it the width we had what would it cost to do that a lot. Uh, I don't know if we have a cost estimate yet do we millions all right let me just see if we have it. It's going to be millions. I know that, but I don't know what the, uh, let's see here. Four or five. Some of the cost is offset by the matching grant, up to 90% in some cases. Uh, yeah, right now we're look. we have 2.25 million. Construction. And 500. About 5 million total. Okay, it's in two fiscal years. So we split it into two fiscal years. So, and, and that's going to 200 feet or 150? No, 16. 150. 150. Right now it's 106. And if we just rehab what we have, the price will go down. We're starting to plan for, in our master plan, 150 foot width, which okay. would cost more money. And, should, and we'll get more grant money, too. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we never do these projects unless you all see 
by the time it gets to the city council level, it's already we've got a contractor lined up, and you've got you've got the exact cost when it comes to an FAA grant. We have to bid it, and the FAA has to know what the actual cost is, which is usually the low bidder. That's where you all will see. You'll see the grant come in and the, and, and the contractor pretty close to the same time with an FAA grant. Also, just as a comment, Eric has a very good working rela relationship with the Florida Department of Transportation on funding at the airport. And there's dedicated revenues or sources of those fundings, and that's why airports are very successful in the fact that Avgas pays for it. It is not an avalorum or a, a tax on everybody. It's, it's on the industry itself. And the Florida Department of Transportation likes good projects that they can show the industry that improvements are being made with the funding that they're providing. Okay, 192, I think we're up to maybe. I guess is that number what? Number 13? Or what is it? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what that is. Go back to the. Yeah. Uh, yes, number 13. And that one's, as the further out you go, the more gray they get. Not by color per se, but by iffy whether they're going to happen. Uh, the utilities upgrade at Citrus Park Village is something we have to consider on how, what direction we're going to go also. We, we've had some interest in um, some potential development of that property that would be other than residential. And uh, airports typically don't really want to be in the residential landlord business, but we've been there for many, many years. Uh, we are going to be looking and discussing that on how another, you know, those fork in the roads, what direction we want to go. It's a good revenue source now, but it's a lot of Headaches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the police would love you, but yeah, that's exactly right. So maybe our police bill will go down if we get. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's yeah, I'd say um, that will happen if we stick to this type what we've always done. But we're looking at this is a change. We're looking at some changes in the future. That's one of them. One ninety three. I'm just pushing ahead on these in case it's somebody stop us if you. Yeah, yeah. T hangar buildings as that was built in 2002, 2003. Where's that building on the map? Over it's uh, number 11. That's city-owned facilities. So those are that was one there we actually went out for an RFP years ago to find out if somebody privately wanted to build tea hangers on that facility just you know just lease the property and build the facility and collect the rent themselves nobody wanted to do it because the cost of construction the numbers just didn't work they couldn't make it work we did it because it was grant funding that we don't have to pay back so for us to do that it met a need and uh, sometimes it's just you know you can't get an FBO to actually facilitate a project we have to come in to meet the need of the market that was one of them and now we need to go in and do some rehab on that, and we're asking the state, in this case, for some funding to help do that. Page 194, what's that on the map? Um, that's the 194. That's the beginning of the uh, two-year project. 16? Yeah. Yeah. Number 16, correct. And you, you, you see that we don't show a widening just yet, uh, but... In our 20-year plan, we're actually looking at a widening of that runway should the need arise over the next couple of years. And, you know, next budget year, I'll come back and have more solid information on that. You know, the, uh, having flown hundreds of times out of Orlando or West Palm or Orlando and out of Melbourne, too, Vero Beach is a great location, central location, better than Melbourne, quite frankly. The, the problem with it is that our population is, you know, that's always been the population. Yeah. The carrier. But I mean, our location centrally, you know, for Stewart or wherever is. It's longer important. to drive to Orlando from here than Melbourne, and that's what's killing Melbourne. Well, it's 45 years. minutes versus an hour to either West Palm or Orlando. I do it all the time, but yeah. whatever. Yeah, we're but, working but, on But what that says is Melbourne's only 45 minutes from Orlando, and it's closer to that than Sanford. So, I mean, you know, the reality is it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. We're not. Right. I mean, the 100 miles we have is a real problem if you do it, you know, 20 or 30 times a year, which I used to, <laughs> 50 times a year. There's about uh, the study that we did under the master plan that shows that there's about 2,800 people per day leaving mm -hmm. from our catchment area, which is about a three-county area, to other airports that would fly from Vero if we had an airline service. Mm -hmm. 2,800 people per day both ways, so, you know, maybe 1,400 each way. And that is 
pretty significant because we got 10% of that. That's two, three flights a day on a regional jet. You know, the interesting thing about that, uh, I'm wasting time, I suppose, but the interesting thing about that was I would have thought the number one destination would have been Atlanta, but it wasn't at all in that. I mean, it had California and New Jersey and whatever. But anyway, for yeah. whatever it's worth. Well, those were destinations not connecting. Yeah. So, but connecting might still go through Atlanta. Okay, that brings us to 196. Southwest apron. Jump. Find that on the map. What's that, Cindy? Boy, I tell you what, you're going to have trouble if you try to build something that's not on the map. <laughs> you got two 17s. Yeah, it's spread around a little bit. That's just that's just both the same project. Okay. Yeah, that's just both the same project. Cindy knows, though. Don't worry about it, Randy. Okay. We're covered. Okay. In other words, we'll, we'll pave both areas in, at once. Yeah, there is 18. 18, for some reason, showed up a little fa faded. But there's only one of them. Oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> okay, 197. Rehabilitate taxiway B. This is a long time out. I'm just curious. Where is it, Cindy? Okay. Boy, you're good. That's the one. That's the one we wrote on. That's the one we wrote on for the Blue Angels in the car, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, we yep that, and of course the runway. We used the the main runway we yeah. closed. For that. And they are coming back. Yes. June of next year. Right before the budget session, so you all be in a good mood. I'm going to put everything I can into the budget. Today. It won't get there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if I get through Jim, I got a maid, you know. I'm impressed with the Blue Angels, but this yeah. Okay. You know, Randy, I've uh, in uh, four years or something, I've been working for the city, including the finance. The airport's always perplexed me, but the good news is it's always worked pretty well. Yeah. Congratulations, Eric. Yeah. I, I got to say I don't completely understand it, but okay. <laughs> is there anyone else have any comment, or are we done with uh, Eric? I just have one quick question. I'm looking at this this page. This is I'm looking at the budget book, page 182, Airport Construction Fund Revenues. Are these grants, or I know I know the way this, these construction works are usually split between your budget and it, grants. But I mean, is this mostly grants, or is this what you pay? Okay. It's all grants except for the three hundred and eighty thousand dollar transfer from the airport fund. If you look at the version of the budget we were just looking at, if you look at page um, one eighty one in the capital project book, yeah. um, you'll see the headers that show the federal versus the state grants there. Right. Yeah, that's probably the easier one to look at. It's hard to tell from the line items in the, yeah, in the I, operating Some of them work. don't match, but that majority of them match. That makes sense. <laughs> I think, like, so, like, like the master plan, I think there's, I don't know, loss in translation somewhere. The Just the 1560 one should match. That's only one, there's only one year in the operating book, but there's multiple years in the capital book. That's, so that's the issue. All right. So then when I look at page 183, and it's the airport master plan for 297, 735, that is the total cost, whereas the 184, 892 is the con contributed from... Uh, from the grant. Yeah, see up the top under the revenue, see the grants, airport master plan grant revenue is 184, 892, and the cost is 297. So. All right, I won't, won't get too, too much into it. That this is sense. probably an easier way to look at it than what ends up in the, just the 15, 16 portion ends up in the operating books. Thank you, Eric, for everything. Yeah, indeed, sure. And thank you, Danielle. Did a lot of work on this. Yeah. <laughs> we don't remember that. <laughs> All right, who's next, Jim? Next, we have the Marine. Jim? Oh. I think he's coming in. Yeah, he's there. Yeah. You want to skip? What's next after Marina? Oh, if Tim's here, okay, he made it. He's sitting out there on the couch, right? Yeah, more comfortable. He's in the comfy chairs. <laughs> Good morning, Council. Uh, Tim Grabenbauer, Marina Director. Thank you, sir. Um, this year's budget request is uh, not a whole lot different from last year's. Um, we've seen uh, increases in. Uh, our visiting customer revenue this year. Um, Vero Beach is continually becoming a destination hotspot for us. Uh, I 
because of the personnel we had, I was actually trying to get a, a couple of part-time positions converted to full-time, but we just don't have the money for it. So we're going to continue um, as on. Um, the revenue is down a little bit, but that's um, all due to fuel pricing. The, the one thing volume, that's actual price? That's price. Volume is actually up. In fact, um, as far as the visiting customers go, the uh, transient dockage this year is up 9% uh, over last year. Diesel sales are up 26% over last year. Moorings are up uh, just 1%. That's the anchorage, but that's because we're pretty well maxed out out there as far as space. Gasoline sales are up 7%. Gasoline sales are more of a factor of uh, summertime business. And the liveaboard, uh, liveaboards were up 41% uh, this year, and that's because of the, the visiting customers staying at the docks with us. So, like I say, as far as the rest of it goes, the, uh, it's down a little bit just because of the fuel pricing. And the lower fuel prices uh, do help us on the uh, credit card discount area of it because it allows us to keep a little more of our revenue. But outside of the fuel sales, it actually looks like your revenues went up. Right. Okay. Cindy, on page 185, the uh, capital, where's the capital balance on this? Yeah, that, that was what I wanted to point out. You know, at this point, with the budget that Tim put together based on the current rates at the marina, he's actually short uh, about $13,000 from having a balanced budget. Um, what he's proposing, and but what we didn't want to do until he had the chance to talk with you about it, is actually to relook those rates and maybe increase some rates, which we think would put his budget into the black by, uh, what did you think, maybe 40 grand right. or something? Yeah, I, we, the last time that uh, I adjusted the, the rates were in 2009, and I used to go a little bit, you know, every year, kind of an escalator effect until the downturn. Uh, but if you look at it from... Uh, 2009 until now, the rate of inflation is about 11 percent, and the, the other facility that we bought, the pricing is still the same, and it's up about 15 percent. So I'm looking at a modest increase of 6 percent for dockage, uh, moorings, and uh, dry storage, and that'll give us about an extra 40,000 bucks. Okay, and you're going to bring that forward? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to bring it forward to you first. So, so August 19th, we'll see that? Or yes. That yes. What you're presuming? Yes. And and with your indulgence, the, the budget then, if you adopt that, would be reflected to, you know, update those revenue estimates, and then it would show a budget that was in the black by like $35,000. But we didn't want to be presumptuous and put that in here until we had a chance That's to talk okay to you about everybody. it. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. Is that enough? Is that, is that up to the rates that are um, Yeah, we don't, uh, you know, I, a lot of the places that I have to compare to have a lot of amenities that uh, Vero Beach doesn't have, like swimming pools and tennis courts and things like that. So I try to keep that in mind. But um, as the, as next year goes, you know, if, if I need to come back and ask for extra money, then that's what I'll do. So. Has the Marine Commission explored any other options to, yeah, improve the... Uh, yes. Um, we're looking at some uh, outside dry storage, uh, outside the front of the building. Um, I just need the, the cash to be able to do it. That's a, that's a minimal one. but uh, That's the north side of the metal? It would be on the uh, east side, actually. The east side of the There's metal. There's a concrete belt. pad where we've got some, like, boat wash um, cradles out front. Could you sell that space? It would be, yes. Yeah, it would be Why three three it? wide, three high. All, all I need is the money. <laughs> so, I, I didn't put it in the budget this year just because... Uh, it is just a function of money, and we need to make sure that the money's there. Since it is an enterprise fund, we prefer not to have a negative number. Well, okay, but is I don't know what's it going to cost. I only Does know that... First, let me ask another question. Does the Marine Corps Commission support it? Yes, they do. Okay. What does it cost? Okay, the uh, the rack storage itself, the components are about um, $30,000. I need to put footers. Um, I'm not sure what that concrete work would cost me. Yeah. yeah. Can we do it with the revenue increase? I mean, at, at this point, the issue that we have is that if you look at the CAFRs, there actually shows a, a negative net asset balance for the marina because of 
and we've talked about this, the debt service. You know, he saddled with the foreseeable future about $340,000 a year in debt service. So although the marina is doing extremely well from where it was in 2009, what happens is every year when we close the fiscal year, the, the debt service is due the next day, and we have to show a reserve of the amount required to pay it on the following day after the fiscal close. And at this point, there is not enough cash reserves to do that. So, you know, it's, it's partly a timing issue. Slowly but surely, he's climbing out of that hole and each year his his cash balances get larger to the point where I think in a few years because of you know the upturn it will have enough funding to cover that at year end but but to, to ha he doesn't have fifty thousand dollars to invest in capital without continuing to go back the other direction into the black up to seven percent or eight or percent and, and let me just continue and and uh, maybe got some deposits from people who wanted to uh, to, to, to do that, or something like that. You know? I, I could certainly try seven or eight percent, and I can always go backwards if it turns out we're well, losing just, uh, customers. Look at the math first. Yeah, is yeah, what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. It, it, you know, if it costs you a hundred thousand dollars to do this versus forty or something, mm -hmm. let's you know, let, you have to stop and think about some other way to do it. But, but if you if there is a demand and people are willing to pay up front a little bit, and and you could um, you could go ahead and do that over a period of time or something, you know, it may, might make some sense. By going up a little bit. Yeah, I agree with all that. And then if you look at, you know, page 199 or 200 or someplace in the uh, capital expenditure book, which Jim's got, why don't we have a page in here at least for 16, 17 for the addition? When, when are we planning for it? <coughs> well, it sounds like we need to get the, the, the full cost of it. You know, yeah, but that's, that's so. But you can still put a placeholder in 16, 17 that you're going to do it. I mean, if the Marine Commission says it should be done, why don't we put it in the book? Yeah. Because we don't. If you look at the ending cash balances on page 199 of 57 in, in the capital projects book, okay. that is total cash balance, not, not unrestricted cash balance. In reality, at the end of each fiscal year, his restricted cash balance is about three hundred thousand dollars, as compared to about sixty grand of actual cash. So, if you look, you know, you see it takes into like seventeen, eighteen, eighteen, nineteen, nineteen, twenty to get up to about one hundred and sixty thousand dollars of unrestricted cash balance, and that still doesn't cover the debt service. So, you know, we we've, we've been doing our best. He's been doing his best to to fund smaller capital projects as he can, but without a, a large influx of cash. This this fund is negative. Well, it is, yeah. It's it's all, it's negative. All that's, all that's fine and good, but you know you're going to add forty thousand dollars or whatever the price increase is. But if I go out to nineteen and twenty, you're never going to have three hundred thousand dollars. So therefore, you're never going to make the addition that you'd make money on. But you can't continue to run the balance more and more negative and and have an audited financial statement that's showing a deeper negative position. So, you either have the cash or you don't. Maker. No, so uh, you have the cash yeah, or you don't. Well, I mean, we, we haven't got the projections in here that show the forty thousand or the the increased the, rate. the right, rates, right. and that's a start. Um, and maybe maybe it has to go up a little bit more. Maybe it has to go to eight um, percent. That would be my point. Yeah, it yeah. has to support itself. Yeah, as an enterprise fund. Yeah, well, let, let's work on the numbers so it does support itself, and you put it in here and and uh, and work it out. Yeah. I think you should have a plan to do it at some point, even if it's eighteen, nineteen, or yeah. whatever. I mean, I, I just well, I, I think, as Randy said, what we need to do is do our projections yeah. better on the revenues, and then we be able to put it in there. How long is that loan commitment, Cindy? Where's that loan commitment? It is into. Hang I'd on, it was a twenty-year loan that started in two thousand seven. Twenty years, about five years ago. And, and we got into the loan for the metal building and all that. Expand. Yeah, well, the metal building, the docks, and the, all the way out to the street. It, yeah, the rental building. Yes. Wonderful. Which, which is another one of those good leases because we're landlords. No, I don't. I'm not. But but well, that's you'll. Waddell, right? Is in there. Yes. Yeah. But you, you'll come back with some further plan on this thing. That is correct, with revenue projections that would support the plan. Yes. Thank you. But again, I the net position, the unrestricted net position of this marina at the end of last fiscal year was minus $123,000. He's got to climb out from that position, which he's doing a great job of doing. 
before yeah. we can send it back the other direction and continue to spend money that isn't being generated. How old are you? And don't answer it, but you're going to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> not by the end of um, <laughs> not by the end of next year's audit. I'm, won't I'm be. 59. I've been there for 18 years. Well, according, <laughs> according to that, we're not going to climb out before you retire. I'll do my best. I made my point. I mean, you're going to come back with something more. I told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're on uh, page 185. Do you think we finished with that? Uh, anyone have questions on 186, please? Or 187, as the case may be. I, I think we're better to stick to page 186 rather than... And page 188, rather than try to break it into two pieces. So page 186 is the total revenue, and page 188 is the total expenditures. Uh, this split between the two of them to satisfy all of, everything else leaves me. I can't deal with it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. In this case, it's better to look at the total th thing. The reason, only reason we do it is for that submerged lands lease that we have to report on to the state every year. Just, just a question. Is it easier to, uh, to lease out the, the dock space than it is the mooring field? No, not necessarily. We've got uh, two different customer niches. So. Is it more profitable to do the dockage? Ah, uh, no, I'd say in some ways the moorings are more profitable because it's a, a very small capital outlay and they, they get a lot of use. Okay. Well, I, didn't, I know in the dockage sometimes you, you, you charge electricity or cable or there's we, other services we do. you go on. Okay. We, okay. we were getting yeah. about $15 a night or something? Is what? We get uh, for the moorings, yeah. yes. Yeah, with the tax, it's, yeah, it's thirteen ninety plus tax. So. But, uh, we're very, very, very popular. So, hmm. hope we stay that way. We just we charge just a flat fee. We don't charge by footage. Um, for the mooring booths, oh, we, moorings. Ju we okay. just charge Sorry. a flat fee. Now, some of our other um, competitors uh, charge a, a cheaper monthly rate of people if we have seasonal people that stay for the month. But we we do not do that. We yeah. We figure if you want to be here, then that's what it's going to cost you. So, and we have, <laughs> so. And we have a dog park. <laughs> yes, and I've been heavily advertising that, actually, and it's worked to our advantage. So. What happens yeah. when two boats moor side by side? Is that one mooring or two? It's, uh, well, we count it as two overnights, but uh, they both pay. Okay. Yeah. Have we got I, a waiting list? The moorings are kind of a first-come, first-served thing. Um, we do have a waiting list right now for slips. It was interesting. We had some uh, some uh, boats that were for sale for a few years, um, all sizes, 20 feet to 50 feet, that actually sold this year. So so the economy must be doing a little better. So, um, But we've got a lot of people walking down there all the time <coughs> looking for slips. So. Bottom line, what happened to you is that, and we've talked about it with the Marine Con Commission at length, is sort of the double whammy of the downturn of the economy at the same time that that grant from fined for paying the paying the mortgage ran out, you know, essentially. And you've done an excellent job of, you know, pulling that back together and climbing, you know, climbing out from that spot, and the progress is great. So. Okay, if there are then no comments on those pages in the expense book, can we move on to the capital book, page 199? And Tim, you'll have to use Jim. All right. Okay, uh, requested capital expenditures for this year are uh, repainting the um, dry stack roof. It's showing some some rust signs. It was last painted about six years ago, so it's time to paint it again. And That's, uh, page two hundred one. Yep. Okay. And then the next next one on uh, actually on page two hundred, center dock replacement. That's our main dock where our office is. Um, there has been some work to the 
it's kind of a main dock with some outer docks. Those were done back in uh, 2000, the outer docks. But the, the main dock, the last time it was really touched was in 1984, and it, 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 it needs to be replaced. It's, uh, it's actually got some components from the Barber Bridge two bridges ago on, on that dock. So, <laughs> so, um, so this would be $25,000 for engineering. Okay. Anyone have any comment? I, I, I kind of wonder if you could rearrange some of this by in, and include the work you were going to do for the, for the the project we were talking about before. I wonder if you can just schedule those so you can fit that in that other forty thousand dollars. I'll take a look at it. Yes, yes, sir. See what we can do. Yeah. Put it over three years or something. Yeah. And and then on page two hundred two, that's a really good comment. On page two hundred two, I call this. Existing Wiggins Marine Bowl was built in 1996. I call it ugly. I used to spend a lot of time near that thing trying to keep children away from it. It is the ugliest, oldest thing that ever was. Oh, you think that's going to last 1819? It, it works. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's interesting. I you know, it's a, a marina forklifts are a very um, they're very expensive to maintain, and I, I had a a salesman come up to me a couple of years ago and from Miami, and he was trying to push a new forklift, and it'd be great to have a new forklift, but uh, I said, so you buy this new forklift, and uh, how long is it maintenance-free? And he said, well, about 18 months, and then you're back into $10,000 a year in maintenance again. So, so that's what this costs to keep running, 10000 Yes, sir. You can always rebuild a machine forever, but... Cindy, I mean, could this, when this is replaced, could this go into the lease program, or, you know, along with uh, Monty's stuff? I mean, does it, we have to we can, buy? We can probably lease that. They do equipment leasing as well as, um, but the yeah, question they do is for, how, they long do you wanna, leasing. Yeah. how long you want to push out the, the debt service, really, is what it comes yeah. to. Seven years or whatever. But the, 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 point, the, the point is, would that be cheaper than paying 10 Ten thousand dollars a year. I just picked up your number. I don't know whether it's right or wrong. Well, I, yeah, I, 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 from what I understand, the lease program they do do the maintenance on the machine. So no, this would this is a municipal lease purchase. Yeah. Yeah. It's your yeah. machine. Yeah. It's just a car oh, loan. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a car loan. Okay. Instead okay. of buying it cash. It. I I think yeah. Let's look at that because I got to tell you, you look at that thing, and I'm anyway. Congratulations for keeping. I bet you know you can keep a seven thirty seven running for thirty years. <laughs> I don't. <know. laughs> I don't have to worry about the forklift falling out of the sky, though. <laughs> you know, again, part of this, even the expenditures that he has scheduled for fifteen, sixteen, are contingent on getting a find grant. Without that find grant, right. we're down to right. maybe forty grand of headroom in cash. And again, that's not on restricted cash. So, you know, the it, it's tight, and it, yeah. it, we can certainly look at it and and you know bounce some of these things around. Yeah. But you can't spend cash that you don't have. Yeah. Why, 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 why I can't, <laughs> can't use credit Because I won't let you. <laughs> because my auditors won't let me. It's a trickle down. I'm just teasing you. You know that. Congratulations. Yeah, I do know. I just and I hate. Right, of course. And I well, and but I <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not happy about it because you know. And, and when we're lucky, if when I retire, I won't be totally bald. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, and, and I'm not happy about that because, as I said, Tim has done a tremendous job of turning this around and and creating the revenue and climbing out of this hole. But it's just that. That loan is killing him, so it's it's. Let's tough. just see if we can if we can implement this uh, this earner. This okay. Earner or yeah. Yeah. All right. Is there anything further on the uh, marina fund? Does anyone have anything else they want to bring up? Do you do anything like a, a, a long range plan or something like that in terms of looking at other marinas and and what what they're doing or I, what you might want to do? I or, do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I I have had a I only have one copy with me today, but. I did this draft master plan back in 2009, and I've kind of updated it as I've gone along. Obviously, uh, I, had, I, had no, I, I can. <laughs> be great. Yeah. Be great. Okay. Thanks. Also, Randy, just for information, there was one done even earlier than that, wasn't it? That talked about the waterfront. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there, there have been several plans that have been done on the marina, and part of the land acquisition was to conform to some of those. Okay. Past plans. Mm -hmm. could, could I see one of the past plans? Or not right this we, We'll get that to you. Okay. Uh, Tim will get it to us, and 
uh, Tamiya distributed. I've got a great big box full of them. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds useful. <laughs> I don't. I don't think this is the year to climb over it. And uh, so, but I, I will make this offhand comment. I mean, I go to marinas in Annapolis and Baltimore and one place or another uh, uh, on brands boats, not my own. And uh, also, I get comments. I know a lot of people that have boats and so on. And, and you know, their view of Vero Beach is a great place, but the marina is a bit tired and worn. No different than Leisure Square. And I, I think we've got to be thinking into the future. I mean, you know, you look at your laundry. Well, you put new washing machines in. You look at the restrooms, but they're kind of like Leisure Square. I mean, they're we're patching upon patching. And the reality is. I would rather have a little classier destination than we've got. I don't know what to do about it, and I respect your point, but you know, we we, we could have a much uh, more marketable institution than we've got. That's all. I mean, with the bus service, everything else, it's. Yeah. So your real dilemma is just, you know, do you try to generate the funds solely within the marina itself, or do you take a one-time approach where you do some of the capital projects that you're talking about through capital infrastructure funds as a donation to the marina? You know, I mean, that, that is your option. I mean, you can do those projects out of 304, and they would be booked as a capital contribution to the marina, and then the marina could carry on from there with, you know, much higher level amenities and possibly better rates, you know. Um, but that's really what you're facing. And that is something we have debated internally of trying to do that and chose not to go that route this year. So, But as Cindy says, that is the, that's Crestlawn Cemetery is an example of that. That's something we can think of. Absolutely. 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 Because I don't disagree that it's a great destination. Absolutely. And Well, I, I would encourage us to think about not changing anything for this year. Okay? We've, got, we've got to tackle Leisure Square and the a community center and, you know, some of those things first. But I, we, we need to be thinking about making this into uh, at least a, an upgraded destination because it, it, it doesn't really, at this Point come to the level that I'd like in Vero Beach, but and, and upgrade project the image. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and upgraded revenue also so that it takes care of itself. So yeah. that you can't charge the rates. Yeah, that you indeed. Yeah. 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 So expand your visions anyway. I think we've been Mr. Gorey? a little bit. <laughs> yeah. This might be uh, just a uh, on the marina. Uh, I, I see next year talking about all of the issues you just addressed, uh, $100,000 is going to be taken from the reserve fund to uh, uh, on the uh, a dock reclamation project. So having said, hearing about 40000 here and so forth, that 100000 as you look at the, uh, uh, on the page uh, uh, 189 of the uh, book, you can see what happens to the uh, uh, cash balance with the $100,000 that is diminished that gets to Cindy's point in terms of various coverages. Mm -hmm. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, uh, the $100,000, is if that's the right number, transfer, mm -hmm. is, is that really come to 6% of the revenue? Yes, 6% of the customer revenue. Yeah. I mean, we could think about in future years a respite on that. You That's know, also an option. As a, as a way of investing in this. Maybe we should be thinking about it. Well, of course, it still wouldn't satisfy you. And, and one of the things I, I pondered doing. <laughs> I think will satisfy me. World domination. But, but, um, That's what we're here for. <laughs> one of the things that I've, I've pondered doing, and maybe I'll do it on the next round of this, is show this budget in terms of both unrestricted ending cash balance and restricted ending cash balance so you can see the progression toward climbing out of that hole. But again, certainly giving him a respite for a couple of years on the, on the 100000 Well, I mean, if we wanted to build these racks, and I'm well familiar with where they go, and all the rest of it. I mean, we could go from the transfer from 100 to 60. Now, that may not satisfy you. But, but that we, means you you've got do to do that. something else in the general fund. Yeah, the, uh, the general fund. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That makes the general fund short again. So um, there's there's lots of different ways to tackle it. And again, I we're happy to, to you know, 
look at the the various ramifications of those. But you know, bottom we're line, we're not finalizing now. But I think you know you're going to come back with yeah, with yeah with the revenues and the projections. And again, you know, you're putting in place though what our expenditures are going to be. Whether you move ten thousand from here to there, yeah, it's going to be irrelevant. But uh, but what? But it's it's a gem, and I don't think we're taking advantage of it. Uh, Randy, Randy, I agree with you. I mean, what it is, is is a projection of what the city's image is like. Yeah. And right now, Leisure Square, I think the mayor pointed that out, is another one of those projections that we, from a image standpoint, is not very good at this point. And so we got to crawl out of that and make it. But at the same time, if our rates get so high, there's options and alternatives for customers in this general area. So, we, um, we have to monitor whatever people yeah. other people are doing. But by the same token, if you look at it as a recreation asset, um, there's nothing wrong with you upgrading it or spending money out of your fund 304, your one cent sales tax, yeah. considering it a capital contribution to their cause, to the Marina's Enterprise Fund, as though it were a grant, and, and then let the operating part of it support itself as it goes forward. Again, particularly considering that it's also supporting $340,000 worth of debt service for an actual capital purchase that is an asset of the city as well. I see nothing wrong with that logic. Of course, you could just take the uh, debt service and move that asset as an asset of the city That's and then the other possibility. Any any pressure of debt service requirements of the marina. And when we talk about Dodger Town, that's about the same amount. So, you know, you could replace the Dodger Town debt service with debt service on that marina. Dodger asset. Town's really spread and thin at this point. Well, I'm saying you have options. <laughs> we, we, we've it's only like spread. Everybody's digging into that pocket. <laughs> I agree with you. But it, my point, my point three being. Three times already. <laughs> but, but again, you know, my point being, it's debt service is debt service. Right. And if you really wanted to make a, a permanent. Um, solution within the enterprise fund that is the marina, you would transfer that debt service payment somewhere else, give him back his $350,000 a year worth of latitude, and let the marina deal with its own capital projects. I mean, that's another option. Well, I think we need to talk about all that in the future, not today. Yeah. But, but I, think I think there's an opportunity to, if we're going to have 6% come out of the marina, I think it could be bigger with the marina getting more income. I think the marina has the potential to make more money. That's all. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, sounds good. About getting showers hey, with money. He will get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's uh, work in waste management. Uh, uh, yeah, solid waste fund. Uh, repeat Everybody performers said, on this yeah, deal. I heard like eight different yeah. ideas. <laughs> What page are we on in the budget book? 195. 195 and 196. Budget book 196. Good morning again. Good morning. We feel special to get to come all three days. <laughs> all three days. Okay, Cindy, this one on, on 196, the negative 175460. You have to look at that um, in the context of the capital program. This was a, a budgeted you know, drawdown of reserves that were built up in order to pay cash for vehicles. So if you hold this up next to um, the five-year capital plan, you'll see that there's a, a drawdown, then a buildup, a drawdown, then a buildup. That's been kind of our mode for the last couple of years, and that would be on page... Help me, money. 204. See, I was all over the airport thing, and now I'm lost. If you look there at the um, at the bottom there, where it shows excess or deficiency of cash over expenditures, you can see that every other year we've programmed for that extra vehicle. So, for instance, in 1516, we come forward with a big balance of about 700,000. We draw it down by 165. The next year we build it back up a little. The following year we draw it down by 165, but we always are retaining a, a very substantial cash balance, and yeah, he's okay. been building cash to buy vehicles. Excellent answer. Page 97, 197 and 199 in the budget book. Professional services, what are we? We're up 70%. Sorry, I'm straight. That's our portion of the 
uh, union negotiations attorney fee. Okay. The garbage truck is a. Uh, is it Garbage truck is a is an expense. Four fifteen. Four fifteen. I'm sorry. Page One ninety nine. You're on one ninety nine, third from the bottom. Yeah. Yes, the, he he actually budgets to yeah. replace vehicles. That's actually two trucks for this year. Yeah. So what he's doing is he's we're paying for him and accumulating cash and then we pay for him again. Yes, sir. So every two years you buy two trucks. Okay. Actually, we buy a vehicle just about every year, but every two years we buy two trucks. We had a conversation about leasing these at one time, if I'm not mistaken. There was a reason that we did it this way. Well, we're just trying to uh, limit the debt service that we have, and if we can accumulate the cash in the context we're doing it. We're, we're on a target to get our trucks on an eight-year replacement cycle, and we're about halfway through that at this mm -hmm. point. So you'll start to see the truck ages getting a lot better as we come back through this. And the maintenance coming back down. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Got it. On page 201, you prepare under goals and challenges. You prepare annual full cost accounting report before March 31st. I'm a bit perplexed. Is <laughs> why are we preparing a separate accounting report? Can you? It's a it's a requirement that we have to do to file a, a full cost accounting, just to show that we're our costs and revenues meet each other. It's a different regulatory requirement than the audit. Okay, that's what. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, not it's outside of Cindy's. It's outside the audit. It's it's not nearly as. Uh, involved as Cindy's is. Once again, I'd like to see a, a goal or challenge for looking for cost savings and efficiency improvement. Okay. Any further comments on the uh Budget book. We have the capital book also on page 207, and I think we pretty well covered that. But interestingly, the uh, one of the trucks being replaced this year is a 1999 on page 207. That is correct. These two rear loaders, the difference between a rear loader and a front loader you see on this, the rear loaders are the ones we use for the residential routes. And the front loaders are the ones that pick up and service the dumpster. So two rear loaders this year and then one next year. And to let you know, in, the, in our fleet, we, we currently have uh, seven rear loaders and four front loaders. That's our full fleet of vehicles, and that's the replacement we're trying to get on. What's flatbed used for? Is that just... Uh, that's on page 207. Right that's used to pick up uh, miscellaneous things, uh, couches or refrigerators or things a lift, like that. that a lift gate on it, you know. Okay. Sure. That weird stuff we have that kind of three. We have three kind of operations that we do. We do our commercial <coughs> pickup with the uh, the front loaders and the residents with the rear loaders. Then we have a special pickup where we have, you know, you can call us and we'll come out and get a, uh, a refrigerator or. You know, and that's an additional fee for that. Further questions on either book? Mr. Gorey? It, this 450, could, could it be slipped a year? No? no. Uh, Peter Gorey again. Uh, yeah, uh, as you uh, notice on page 196 of the budget book, uh, there is no debt service because there's no debt. Yet, if you look at the capital outlays on this page, uh, uh, 196, capital outlays of $451,000, and the operating income is 437000 my only point, it says it's a capital outlay, and 
would not a potential option be to, uh, uh, with the uh, interest rates at historical lows, this is indeed a capital investment to consider, perhaps, a capital investment by debt. You know, again, we've looked at that, and, you know, given the, the low level of our rates and the fact that we've built up enough reserves to pay for these in cash without, you know, these are very expensive vehicles, so a loan on these would be lots more cost than interest. You know, once he gets through this next uh, four or five years or every other, we replace two cycle, you've got a pretty long period of time where you're not going to need that kind of investment. And I, I don't know, I guess we just think that this is one area where why, why increase our debt service load? This is managing itself, the rates are good, we've got the cash to do it, and why, why start into debt on an enterprise fund that's perfectly well working? And the, the other side of the argument is if we, if we did lease that particular truck, um, that would f free up enough for us to, to fund the OPED. Um, no, because this is an enterprise fund. This is an enterprise fund. Okay, okay, okay. Well, you can take it. You just got to change your policy. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's not just change so the policy. The, just, so the, just so the council understands, okay. yeah. you're dealing with two very conservative people here. Debt service is not a positive thing. I know it defers your cost out and somewhere makes it look better, but the fact of the matter is whenever we can get from here to there without a debt, that's what we try to do, and so yep. that, that's what you're sort of stuck with on our side, carrying out policy. You set the policy, you want to go into yep. debt, hey, we can make that happen, too. So. I, to I like it. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that when you look at that, stabilization too. Mm -hmm. you know, you see that negative, but I guess the CAFR, you know, that I'm looking at from that last year looks like it's 673000 but I assume you guys keep a balance uh, of cash in that account that make, keeps it positive. That's six hundred seventy-three thousand in cash. It was part of the four hundred fifty that was spent, I'm sure. No, what we're saying is last year's CAFR. If you look, that's what we ended with a cash balance of that. So, so if you look at the again, if you look at the five-year capital plan, it right. shows that the cash is around seven hundred. We build it up a little bit, then we pull it down a right. little, but we never dip below about five hundred thousand dollars in cash. But the budget, by nature, is really kind of follows the income statement. It really doesn't give you a statement of what the balance is unless you look in the five-year capital. If you want the cash balance, right. but again, the, in this particular enterprise fund, the cash balance and the real net balance are pretty similar because there's no debt service. So, I mean, it is almost a, it, it's pretty much a cash operation. And so when you talk about net cash balance here, you're talking about unrestricted net cash balance. There's really no restrictions for debt because we have none. An enterprise fund. But there's no restrictions for debt because we have none. So, you know, again, this is a very much a cash operation and, and it seems to be working and certainly not taking on debt provides for future rate stabilization because we're not going to have upward pressure on costs like gas prices as well as having debt that we've taken on. So I, you know, I think we're yeah. Okay, are they excused? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, don't go with it. <laughs> It's uh, 10.37, we're going to get into, I, I think maybe the next thing we should do is the OPED, because you got to consider that before you. Can we take a break? Yeah, and yeah. what I was going to say, why don't we take a break on that clock up there till uh, 10.50, okay?